Forget frequently asked questions. Common sense. Common knowledge. Or Google. How about advice from a real genius? 95% of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed. 5% go above and beyond. They become very good at what they do. But only 0.1% a real Jesus. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius Podcast. My goal is uh, threefold. I want to find the people in their fields that are really the experts, the geniuses. Those are probably at least one in a hundred, if not one in a thousand. I also want to ask them questions that they don't typically get asked um, because that makes for a better interview, I think. And, you know, why listen to the same thing? They may have been asked a thousand times. Let's see if we can do something different. And I want to inform listeners and give them uh, really interesting stuff they may not hear. So those are my goals. And today I have uh, Nicholas P. Money. He's a professor. I had him on before. He's a the author of a book called The Selfish Ape, which I've been making my way through. Uh, It's an excellent book. And today we're going to talk about his uh, other big area in his life, and that's uh, studying fungi. He's been doing that for many years, uh, researching at Miami University. So we're going to be talking about that. So, Nick, thanks for coming again. Yeah, good to talk with you again, Richard. Yeah, what, what first attracted you to consider fungi and mushrooms? How long ago? What attracted me probably was my profound ignorance about these organisms. I knew really nothing about the fungi when I went to university. I attended um, uh, Bristol University in the United Kingdom. And so I went to Bristol at the age of 18. And one of the first lectures that I had in biology was by a professor who was talking about the fungi. And I was just utterly captivated by his description of this vast group of organisms that really, again, I knew nothing about them beyond seeing mushrooms in the woods. That was about it. And so I sort of fell in love with that professor and his, uh, and his message. And I ended up as a, as an undergraduate. So really as a teenager working in his lab, uh, when I wasn't attending classes and this was really, um, a revelation for me. And then sort of many decades later, I'm still fascinated by the fungi and I've really dedicated my professional research career to, to working on these intriguing organisms. But I, 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 I love that idea, actually, of, of the power of, a, of an educator to actually sort of have that almost evangelical power to just capture the imagination of a teenager. So, that's, um, yeah, it still amazes me. But that's, that's, my, that's the story of my genesis as a mycologist. Well, I've, I've had, you know, I'm sure a lot of people hopefully have had professors that were good and bad, and some of them they really liked. And sometimes you know, really great professors can get you into a field you never thought you'd be in just because they're so great. So yeah, yeah that's yeah. excellent. I, I think that's true. I mean, you, you've interviewed a lot of, um, you've interviewed a number of immunologists, for example, on your, some of your, your previous uh, podcasts. And um, yeah, I'd be sort of interested to know what was it? Maybe they were in, they were in med school or they were in a microbiology class and they heard something about the complexity of the immune system. I, I think most, most scientists have got an interesting story, I think, about how they, how they became a specialist. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So what have you been studying in the world of fungi for multiple decades? What's been the focus? And then we'll, we'll ask, where is it today? Yeah, um, I became interested quite early on in biomechanics. So the way that fungi move, which sounds probably a bit counterintuitive since we regard fungi as the, or many people do, as the embodiment of sluggishness. But in fact, fungi are highly mobile organisms and they they move without the aid of any musculature. And so that really, really interested me quite early on as as an undergraduate, in fact, in just the mechanisms that they use to grow, for example, how do they grow from one place to another? And later on, I became really interested in how they, they move for reproductive purposes, how they're spores are dispersed. So yeah, this, this biomechanics of the fungi, certainly a very specialized area of, of investigation, but that has always captured my attention probably more than other, more than the, more than what, more than sort of descriptive mycology describing new species, for example, but um, perhaps we'll talk about. How do they move 
and under what circumstances will they move? What are some examples? Well, if we think about you think about growth movements through through growth, which is so fungi have these filaments, they're microscopic filaments, so they might be only about the diameter of a red blood cell, but they can grow to quite long lengths over many millimeters, and these structures extend at their tips. It's a process of what we call tip growth for, for good reason, and this is what allows fungi to penetrate solid materials like the leaves of plants that they're infecting, but also to infect animal tissues, including human tissues, the way that they can penetrate the skin. Um, this is the process of invasive tip growth. And so I looked at that for, for many years from a mechanical perspective. And I found that fascinating for a number of reasons. One thing that really intrigued me was and, and sort of challenged me and students in my lab too, was to figure out new ways of actually making measurements of some of the mechanical properties of these cells. It's not easy, obviously, when you're dealing with something that's microscopic to actually figure out how to measure how much force it's exerting. And so that's one thing that we, we mastered a good few years ago, ago now. But I think some of the the technology, such as it was at the time, we, we, we were really sort of pushing the boundary of what could be measured in those, those experiments. So what are some really crazy or amazing things you've learned about uh, you know, how, how fungi move or the force they're able to exert or how far they're able to move or how fast? Yeah, so just on the, on the, the, the issue of sort of force generation, that they actually pump themselves up with hydrostatic pressure and they use a proportion of the, a proportion, a portion, some of that pressure to actually push against their surroundings. And so this is actually ha- part of how they make their way through um, physical obstacles, the way that they can push into tough tissues. Now, they're also releasing enzymes at the same time, and those are actually loosening the or solubilizing the materials in their surroundings. But the physical force is also a really important part of that, um, that process of movement. And perhaps the most spectacular example that we looked at was it's become famous really in quite a lot of, or not our work, but the fungus itself has become famous or infamous for its mechanical properties. And it's a fungus called the rice blast fungus that penetrates rice leaves. So it's agriculturally very important. And that thing produces a little infection pad and then it pushes down on the leaf surface and it pushes its way into the the plant, and it may be using enormous pressures to do so. There have been various estimates of how high those pressures run, but we're, we're dealing with many tens of atmospheres of pressure to actually push through that cuticle and cell wall on the leaf. So that's become huh. that's really interesting. It's also interesting, too, because, of course, to actually make use of that force, it's got to stick itself to a surface very tightly, and that's something that this fungus does with um, with probably with unparalleled uh, strength in the way that it sticks to the surface. So that's one thing that, that has fascinated me. Then the other thing is if we look at the reproductive lives of the fungi and the problem of dispersal, because after a fungus reproduces, then it produces large numbers of spores. And those microscopic spores, if they're going to find a new food source, they need to move around. They need to be dispersed by air or water. And so that's another whole series of experiments that we, a whole program of experiments that we engaged in over many years in my lab was to look at these mechanisms. And a lot of them are very high speed mechanisms. So they actually, again, using, so I said that the, the filaments of fungi, they pump themselves up with hydrostatic pressure. Well, that hydrostatic pressure can also be used to power a squirt gun. And that's what some fungi do is to actually squirt their spores through the air. And so that's Hmm, something that we looked at. And uh, the fastest thing that we found actually was moving at about a hundred, a little bit over a hundred kilometers an hour, which is pretty fast. Um, What's that in miles per hour or kilometers per second? About about 70 miles an hour. But for a microscopic (laughs) structure, it is really impressive. So, you know, 70 miles an hour, yeah, fast enough if you're, if you're in a, in a car, but it's, it's more impressive for a fungus because those individual spores are microscopic. And so air represents for them relatively a much more viscous medium in which to move. And so this, this means that they have to be launched with an incredible acceleration at the beginning of the process. Otherwise, they're not going to make their way through air at all. And I'm only talking about flights here of a few 
<clears throat> a few millimeters or in some cases centimeters. But that's what happens is that these squirt guns blast these spores into the air at these incredible accelerations and attain this uh, maximum speed of 100 kilometers an hour. But they're only doing that over the course of a, of a few microseconds of action. Well, I, got a, I got a question for you earlier. You said that fungi can infect tissues. But are they infecting or are they just penetrating in and then releasing like digestive enzymes to eat the tissue? So that's, that's going back to these growth mechanisms then rather than these these reproductive movements, as I'll call them, but with the, um, so that they're, they're, these are much, much slower. When you're talking about tissue invasion, this is something that's occurring on, over on the course of perhaps the maximum rate there would be on, on the orders of order of tenths of a millimeter per, per hour. So you can actually watch this under the microscope and it's more obvious when you use a, um, some kind of t- time-lapse system, but that's quite a slow movement through plant or animal tissues, but it's a combination of using enzymes to actually degrade, to solubilize the, the complex materials in our skin, for example, or on a plant surface, and, and then actually to use this mechanical force to, to overcome the, the residual obstacle to, to motion. Does that make sense? <laughs> right. Well, once it enters into tissue, I mean, I know it does it quickly, but it, is it infecting on a cellular level or is it just adjacent to tissue and it, and it eats it like oh, how does it interact with the tissue so that's a great question so fungi do both things in, in plants and animals so in some cases they're actually just digesting and, and destroying tissue as they they move through and pushing between cells but there's plenty of examples of fungi that infect plants and infect animals where in fact their cells do penetrate the the cells of their hosts and we can see that in medically important fungi where actually there are fungal cells being actually inside cells of the immune system like macrophages that they've actually been engulfed but they're still alive within those active cells in the immune uh, system okay i just didn't know the mechanism on how it uh, it enters in and then in terms of um oh go ahead i was just going to say too that so that there it's in addition to actually making their progress making it easier for them to move through solid tissues by releasing enzymes. The other thing is a lot of the materials that are released through that enzyme action then are actually can be absorbed by the fungus as a fuel source. So you can think about uh, short chain fatty acids that are released or peptides and so forth. Well, the fungus or free amino acids or sugars, the fungus then can absorb these materials and actually use them to fuel their metabolism. So it's, it's clearing the way, it's making it easier for them to penetrate tough things, but it's also that they're, they're able to absorb these materials as a food source. And they're, this, this invasive growth, we call it invasive hyphal growth of fungi, it's really a characteristic of, of many of these fungi, those that we call the filamentous fungi. What's, um, what's, I don't know, amazing about fungi, can they penetrate any tissue, animal, plant, otherwise, or like, you know, what, what special abilities do they have in this regard? Well, it's, it's so this this work is this was quite a few years ago now, but actually going back to the fungus that infects rice plants, that thing is able to punch tiny little holes, but through materials like Kevlar. So when that work was first published, that was you know that created a, some interest in the uh, in in the media that we had a fungus that actually could penetrate, could push holes through bulletproof vest material and so forth and these are very very thin films of kevlar but nevertheless pretty impressive that they could generate enough force to push through that stuff so we actually looked at the way that they could penetrate all manner of things like little little films made from different plastics and actually many many decades ago some of the original work was done with with looking at these fungi and the way that they could they could dent gold leaf and uh, thin films of gold so again in in these cases we know that it's not it's not enzymes that are involved, but we're, pure, we're looking purely there then at the physical attributes, the physical force exerted by these microorganisms. And then what about how the spores spread? What are some of the special ways in which they do it? You said they can shoot fast, but can they go very far? And you know, what's some of the special mechanisms of that? Yeah, there's, there's a whole range of different mechanisms that we find in the fungi, mechanisms for moving that we find in the fungi that we don't encounter elsewhere in biology. One of my favorite ones is a fungus called the artillery fungus, and it forms a, an extraordinary fruit body. It's sort of a miniature mushroom. The thing's only a millimeter or so in diameter, 
And what happens is that as it matures, it opens up and forms a cup within a cup. Although if you look at it from above, it looks like this star-shaped structure. And then it blasts this capsule containing lots of spores. So the capsule is perhaps half a millimeter in diameter, and it's, it's um, usually got this brown or, or blackened appearance. It'll shoot that capsule over six meters. So that's got the, the distance record for, that holds the distance record for the fungi that we've, we've looked at. So that capsule is actually carrying millions of spores through, through the air. And I'm told that if your hearing is really acute, um, so I remember students telling me this in the lab, that they could hear this popping when these, these little plungers produced by this fungus, the artillery fungus, evert, and they could actually hear this as the, or rather hear the pinging of the capsules as they hit the underside of the uh, culture dish lids. But due to my misspent teenage years, um, uh, I used to go to Motorhead concerts in the 1970s in, in, in Britain, so my hearing is actually pretty, pretty poor, at least I blame That's it funny. on blame it on motorhead but you know if you're a student with good hearing apparently you can you can pick this up but that's that's a pretty impressive thing that you've got a fungus that's actually noisy when it shoots its uh shoots its capsules into the air what what decibel range is it oh no idea <laughs> you know, you'd have to come, so come it's to the quite lab. audible or right yeah i mean faintly audible as a as a ping on the on the on the petri dish lid <laughs> but outside my range of hearing anyway <laughs> that's cool though yeah, it's very cool. Yeah, yeah. There's a there's a few other there's another a group of fungi, the cup fungi. That some of those when they shoot their spores, um, that it's sort of a, a what's what's the a domino effect where where one of these little structures, it's it's really like a miniature torpedo tube. When it shoots its spores in the air, it actually causes a wave of these st- structures within this this cup to fire, and that can be heard as a sort of a sizzling sound too so uh, and again and those spores are being shot at immense immense speeds and you can actually see it as a cloud of spores if you if you're in the right position when this happens you can see this cloud of spores emerge from the the cup on the floor of the the forest so yeah it's a beautiful mechanism you know there with some some of the uh diversity in the fungi world that you think is really interesting like some of the diverse forms or unusual things the structures that they make Wow. Yeah, that's a good question. It's difficult to know where to start with that. I mean, they're such a, they're, the fungi are such a be- beguiling part of nature. And also their visual beauty, at least to my mind, extends over many, many different spatial scales. So you've got these, you can think about gigantic shelf fungi that are jutting from rotting logs. And some of those can be, well, the largest ones, maybe even as much as a meter in diameter. And then you can think about, or I think about, coral fungi that grow on rotting wood. And there, to appreciate their beauty, you might need a, a magnifying loop, a hand lens to look at them and, and look at the intricacies of their structure. And then under the microscope, at higher magnification, much higher magnification, you've got all manner of fungi. There's a, there's a beautiful one that I've only really seen. Only really, I've only seen it once or twice, and it's... Um, it's, it looks like a miniature chandelier. And so you've got the light from the microscope bulb illuminating this, this structure and all the little spores sparkle. It's, it's really utterly beautiful. But I'm going through several spatial scales, you know, going from a few thousandths of a meter in size to uh, perhaps a meter in, in diameter. So what, three orders of magnitude in size. But one thing that's interesting in terms so that sort of gets at the visual visual measure of fungal diversity but in fact the diversity of the fungi is far greater and if we look with genetic methods we can see that there's an incredible array of catalog of fungi in the natural environment that we really know nothing about we know that they're there because of their genetic signatures we don't really know what they're doing because they're it's difficult or impossible to grow them in culture but that's really probably where most of the diversity of the fungi lies it's in these microscopic uh organisms that grow in the soil or in freshwater ecosystems and we we don't really know much about what they're doing they're interacting with other single-celled uh microorganisms probably in the that environment at least some of them are and we know that some of them do things like they infect diatoms. So these are these single-celled, shelled, photosynthetic organisms, plankton. And we know that they're 
infected by some of these fungi, but we don't really know much about what these other things are doing. Intriguing, but you know, new methods are being developed all the time, and I'm, I suspect that we will get to know more about them. But if we just use visual characters to, as a measure of diversity, it's really not perhaps as informative as, as was thought a generation or two ago. So are fungi one cell that's just enormous and widespread all over the place, or are they multicellular? I mean, you know, what, what does their structure look like on a cellular level? What is a cell to a fungi? What components does it have? That's, that's a great question. So it's even there, there's diversity. So we can think about where there are um, over 100 different species of, over 100, over 1,000 species of fungi that we call yeasts. And those in general grow in a single cell form. So you've got a mother cell that produces a bud and then that bud will, or daughter cell will break from the surface of the mother and then she will go on and produce further generations of buds. So that's a single celled example, an example of a single cell fungus. And there are many yeasts and there are many other fungi that grow with that, that form. But we find with the kinds of fungi that are penetrating solid tissues that those grow with a filamentous form and in that case, in the, the filament, there are, often there are a series of, of compartments. So under the microscope, it looks like a ladder, a very thin ladder that extends across the field of view of the microscope. And in each of those compartments, there might be hundreds of nuclei. And so the whole structure is multinucleate. Uh, but we might describe that whole filament as a cell, but it's a multinucleate cell. Or we, perhaps we could use the, we could refer to those individual compartments as as cells, but their construction is it's another unique feature of fungal biology that there's nothing else out there that's constructed in quite the same way. How are nutrients passed from one part of a fungi to another part? So it appears that most of the nutrients, when you're looking at one of these filaments, and then these filaments branch to form a whole structure called a mycelium. So that's the technical term for the colony formed by a fungus. What appears to happen is most of the absorption of nutrients is occurring at these tips as they grow through there, through the environment, in the environment. And then nutrients are moved through the mycelium, back through the, backwards through the cytoplasm in these, these filaments. Now, some of that's occurring by diffusion, but there also, also seem to be mechanisms of bulk flow where the, um, uh, the, the nutrients are dissolving in these fluid filled spaces called vacuoles inside the filaments. And then actually there, there can be mass transfer of those materials over much longer distances. So this has been studied really beautiful work using radioactive isotopes to actually track the movement of nutrients through a colony. And uh, so that's, that's how it works in that case. It's not really a circulatory system. Uh, but anyway, there is this mass flow of, of fluid within some kinds of fungal filaments. But if people had a, um, a fungi system where, I don't know, let's say it's a foot long, and they give nutrients to one end, and they observe it going through the whole mycelium, and how? Yeah, so there's some, there has been work that's shown that this occurs. What's interesting, what interests me there is that you can do these experiments in a um, sort of a sandbox where there's very low levels of nutrients available to the colony. And a fungal colony, if it's unopposed, will grow outwards in a centrifugal fashion, so producing a circular um, form. But if you drop nutrients in one place, so perhaps if you put a, a, a block of sugars in one location, uh, what you find is that there are many fungi that will actually divert all of their resources toward that food resource so they'll actually change their direction of growth toward that um toward that that source of nutrients and then you do indeed see nutrients dispersed throughout the larger colony but it's this continuous hunt for food in that stress you know stressful experiment there where they're growing in an otherwise low nutrient environment so it's partly diffusion and again it's partly this process of uh, mass flow of fluid within these within the, the central part of these filaments. How about sensing? Um, you have, a, again, like, I don't know, a foot-long mycelium. You stimulate one end of it. Does the other end do anything? You know, can it, does it have, like, a nervous system? Yeah, I mean, you can, take, you, you can take that too far. But, yes, there are ways in which it seems that the, the fungus can actually communicate across the breadth of its colony. And so we see a number of examples, a number of instances of, of this, um, could and we can refer to that as a form of communication between different parts of the colony to say, look, there's food over here, 
well, there's no food over here. Let's, let's go look somewhere else. But so it is a molecular kind of communication, but we have to be wary about going too far with that and, you know, starting to describe the language of the fungi and so forth. Um, although I suppose if we look at it, I mean, we can look at human communication. I mean, it all comes down to everything comes down to chemistry in the end. So there we go. What, what, what about fungi have you observed that just, I don't know, baffles you or baffles science that they just have no clue about what's going on yet? Well, that's a good question. Probably one thing is that we, we know a great deal about the way that mushrooms release their spores. So if you think about a mushroom and you look underneath the cap and there are all of these gills underneath that mushroom, or in some cases there are tubes that uh, extend from the bottom of the, from the cap. Um, and we know a good deal about the mechanics of the way that the spores actually move. But the timing of that process, the de developmental process that primes these spores for discharge, we know absolutely nothing about that. We know, we know less than nothing about that. We know that the spores develop on this very carefully coordinated developmental, uh, there is a carefully coordinated developmental program that they follow. And we can measure this in different ways, but we have no idea about the underlying genetic controls for this. It's really, I mean, the spores are very crowded together often, but you don't see spores that are shot. I mean, there's, there's a delay between adjacent spores before they're shot. How the heck is that timing actually controlled? So a lot of the things that are most baffling about the fungi are really these questions in developmental biology. I mean, how is it that a particular kind of mushroom, pick the fly agaric as an example, so that iconic mushroom with the red cap with the white spots on it. How come each time that mushroom, that kind of fungus reproduces, it forms a fruit body that's immediately identifiable as a, as a fly agaric mushroom? We don't know what those rules are. We don't know how that development plays out. I find that absolutely fascinating. Uh, so... How do the spores spread? Is it that in certain cases, are there animals or other creatures, insects, et cetera, that will help spread the spores? You know, they'll land on a mushroom and the spores will get onto them or they'll brush by it or they'll eat it. I mean, what, what are the ways in which uh, fungi partner with other creatures so they can spread it? Yeah. So a lot of fung fungal spores are just dispersed in by air currents, by wind. Um, and as I said earlier, you can see clouds of spores being released from certain kinds of of fruit bodies, but there are many interactions also with insects and other invertebrates. And so a lot of fungal spores are actually, do appear to be dispersed by uh, what? Mollusks, mollusks, yeah, gastropods, slugs and snails, and uh, insects, as I said, are important and other kinds, kinds of invertebrates. And then we've also got plenty of examples of fungi whose spores are dispersed by vertebrate animals. So if we think about truffles, for example, and a whole different groups of fungi that we call false truffles, those fruit bodies, their spores are never exposed to the air, but they're, the truffles are providing nutritional reward for the animals that eat them, and including humans. And then animals then disperse those spores as they, those spores that actually survive passage through the digestive system, then that's another mechanism of dispersal that we see in the fungi. So they use multiple multiple mechanisms, but combination of just using, I suppose, in most cases, inver invertebrates and then wind. Is there, um, so if I see like a patch of mushrooms somewhere, is that all one mycelium or would there be multiple myceliums that just get arbitrarily close? No, the, the only way to figure that out clearly would actually be to take some samples and actually look at the genetic level and actually look if you're dealing with a single mycelium or, or a group of mycelia. Often when you look at something like a, a fairy ring where you see all these mushrooms emerging in a, a ring uh, structure in a meadow, for example, it's likely that you're dealing with a single mycelium there, but it could be that that mycelium actually consists of more than one individual. It probably does consist of more than one individual. So usually what happens when mushrooms reproduce and, and form, uh, mushroom forming fungi reproduce to form fruit, fruit bodies there's at least two partners that come together and merge then to produce a, 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 um, uh, a unified mycelium from which then the fruit bodies are born. So yeah, depends upon oh, your... So they don't, uh, they don't stay separate if, if, if you know, it's, let's say a bunch of spores land in an area and they form myceliums. Do they tend to all coalesce into one or do they stay separate? 
Well, it, it's, it's, it differs. It differs from species to species. Um, and I mean, often there are, if you've got some, if you've got a whole population of different spores in that one location, actually the little colonies that grow will compete with one another for resources and actually even engaged in chemical warfare to sort of outgrow the other small colonies in their area. So there's this competition. But then for every example of competition we see, we also see some examples of resource sharing among colonies. But no, I mean, fusion of colonies is not a given. We certainly see plenty of uh, examples of this, but that's certainly not the way that most fungi operate. What about, um, you know, how do they interact with microbes or viruses? Are there like fungi viruses or... You know, oh, do, uh, mushrooms have a microbiome, for instance. Yeah, so there's some. So fungi, there are many viruses that have sp- specific interactions with fungal cells. Um, there are many kinds of bacteria that interact very, have very specific relationships with fungi, and also different kinds of algae that partner with with fungi. Um, so we see this, and in terms of the the idea, the concept of a mushroom microbiome, this is really interesting and indeed there are some studies now that have begun to look at this and the more that we look using molecular tools the greater the diversity of organisms we actually find within something that appears to be just a single fruit body a single mushroom but in fact there's there's often a lot of different (laughs) a lot of different microbes going on in that mushroom including one more than one species of fungus so we find different yeast species associated with fungal fruit bodies and uh, many kinds of bacteria and other kinds of microorganisms. So absolutely. But I mean, that was really very poorly understood until genetic techniques were brought to bear to actually look at what's going on. So uh, a a mushroom or a fungi is actually uh, a multitude of organisms. It's not just one thing or especially the fruiting body part of it is, or. Well, I suppose it depends upon, it depends upon your definition of the individual, right? I mean, are you and I individuals or are we a, well, we're certainly a sum of our parts, right? In term, including all of the microorganisms that constitute our microbiome. And I think we can say the same thing for, for a fungus. We could say that indeed there's more than one thing there. Huh. No, that's really interesting. It's actually quite, think- quite a controversial area there. Are, um, I have a colleague that's actually working on a book on this topic on individuality within the fungi. It seems like it should be straightforward. There's a, there's a mushroom, there's a colony, but it's far more complicated than, than that. But then, you know, we see this in the in the zoological world too, as I said, with the microbiome, onboard microbiome associated with any every animal. Yeah. Are there are there any animals that this is probably gross have fungi that make fruiting bodies on them while they're alive and just hang out on their skin or in their fur? Or- <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, there's there's some interesting examples of that. We find insects with fruit bodies. There's the famous. Um, the species of cordyceps and other pathogens that actually grow in insects like ants and then burst through the, the head of the ant at some point. So you see these, see these ants with uh, fruit bodies growing from their heads. I and mean, we don't see anything that spectacular in uh, interactions between fungi and mammals. But I mean, there are examples of fungi, awful fungal infections of humans where we begin to see the formation of fruit bodies. And these are in patients whose immune systems have been severely debilitated. And so they just become living, living Petri dishes. So these are awful, awful infections. But I mean, we've got, if you think about more common kinds of um, fungal growth, fungal infections that uh, plague us, things like athlete's foot and so forth. I mean, you've got the, it's not a fruit body that's formed, but under some circumstances, the fungi growing between our toes can actually begin to produce spores. So there's certainly fruiting down there. Awful to behold. And then, um, yeah. <laughs> I mean, we, this is, this is another topic, but I mean, the range of interactions between fungi and the human body is, is immense. And I mean, you can, you can begin by thinking about, Asthma, for example, I mean, hundreds of millions of humans suffer from asthma and some proportion of them, it's difficult to figure out what proportion, but certainly more than 10% of those. I mean, the primary cause of their allergic response seems to be sensitivity to fungal spores. And then so you mm, yep. global market for nasal sprays and inhalers. I mean, that's tens of billions of dollars every year. And I mean, I could go on. It's, it's these interactions are many and very diverse 
and some are horrible and some are brilliant. It's all part of this symbiosis between humans and fungi, this rich relationship, set of relationships. So what do you think are some untapped resources in fungi that we could use you know, to help our own health or for, you know, for other purposes? Like, are there any exciting areas that people are researching that have applications, again, for for human health or for yeah. even yeah. engineering type applications, those kinds of things? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, in terms of health and human health and well-being, there's a lot of work that's going on. I mean, most people don't realize that serious fungal infections plague um, a couple of hundred, um, well, how many people are actually affected by serious fungal infections per year? I mean, it might, might be as many as, as, as tens of millions of, of patients. I mean, one and a half million people, I think that's the latest estimate, are actually killed by fungal infections every year. So research on in medical mycology, medically important fungi is, is really, really important. And there's a search for new kinds of antifungal drugs to treat things like there's a fungal form of meningitis that's absolutely devastating. Um, so there's a lot of interest in developing new drugs to treat these infections. I suppose a more positive side would be, or a more yeah, a more uplifting side would be to think about the way that fungi are a source of antibiotics to treat bacterial infections. Um, and many, many drugs are produced by genetically modified fungi. So half of the world's injectable insulin is produced by genetically modified yeast. And so that's a you know vast market there. I mean, that's um, that market's worth at least $15 billion. So and, and fungi are used actually produce, again, genetically transformed fungi are used to produce other kinds of drugs that are very important, lots of medical applications. So, yeah, there's a huge amount of interest among biotechnologists in using fungi as a platform for drug production and also for producing all kinds of industrially useful chemicals, enzymes and so forth. So, yeah, okay. huge interest. And then what, what, uh, what's happening right now? Just a couple more questions and then we got to go. What's happening right now in your research? What's the latest and greatest? Or are you, are you wrapping things up? Wrapping things up. I mean, I, I haven't been doing a, a lab-based research now for, for a few years. I've really become a, uh, a science writer more than anything, but I'm fascinated in fungal biology and I keep up to date with this. I'm also involved as an editor of one of the big fungal journals. So I'm still absolutely okay. fascinated by the activities of these these fungi, and uh, I'm think I'm becoming more interested now, actually, in some of the, uh, the 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 significance of fungi in human health and well-being, which we've just been talking about. Do you grow any at home? Like, do you have uh, any colonies that your wife wants to throw away that you <laughs> grow just for to look at? I, I, I tried that years years ago with um, no success whatsoever. So I'll leave that to. Uh, people that are much more talented at mushroom cultivation. But uh, yeah, I did put a lot of energy into that and I was su supremely unsuccessful. So, <laughs> oh, no. And uh, last question, um, you know, uh, magic mushrooms or hallucinogenic mushrooms. Um, I don't know. What, what have your thoughts been on those for, you know, as you've encountered them and thought about them? Yeah, I've, I've never, I've never experimented with them myself, but I've certainly had plenty of people tell me how much they've, they say that they gain from the experience, and it's, it really is fascinating the way that uh, medicinal mushrooms, or rather the um, psilocybin, one of the potent uh, psychoactive compounds in magic mushrooms, is actually being used now to um, what appears to be a successful treatment for clinical depression that seems to uh, resist treatment using um, anti other or antidepressant medication. Um, there's also work with with um, these magic mushrooms or the psilocybin formed by magic mushrooms, then using that to actually treat PTSD and maybe also to support patients that are going through um, withdrawal from, from um, long-term drug use. So this is really, really interesting, the way that we might be able to use this compound to actually improve our mental health. That's really cutting edge and very interesting. Well, excellent. Well, Nick, it's been a good call. Lots of uh, interesting things to look at and see and uh, um, I want to direct people first you know to your book The Selfish Ape it's sitting right next to me and I'm making my way through it it's a good book black cover with like a it looks like a um, an eclipse somewhat you know a reddish eclipse anyway yeah, good book making, make, making my way sounds like a, a, an inordinate <laughs> a, a trudge through thousands of pages of, of oh, no, uh, no. scientific tedium but nevertheless 
No, actually, it is an easy read. It's, it is you know, an easy read. Like, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's sobering, but it's easy. Sobering and, and, and sobering and brief. Yeah. Yeah. I want to point listeners to that. You know, the selfish ape, they can get it everywhere, Amazon, et cetera. And it's new. Um, and then what's another way for them to find out more about fungi? You know, we covered a lot of topics. So if there's something about them that interests people, how can they start learning about them? Well, there's a, there's a wealth of uh, web resources on the fungi. I mean, you just you, you won't have any trouble locating information on the fungi. Um, if any listeners are interested in learning more about some of my writings on fungal biology, they can check out my website, which is themycologist.com. But as I said, there are a lot of commentators on fungal biology that you'll find online. I like the website mushroomexpert.com. Uh, but there, there's just there's so many out there. It's I think part of the reason for that really is just that fungi or mushrooms are just so photogenic, and so that's one of the things that's things that's driven. Um, they they you know they show very well on the internet. Yeah. Okay. Well, very good. Well, Nick, thank you for coming. I appreciate it. Great, great talking to you again, Richard. You've been listening to the Finding Genius podcast with Richard Jacobs. If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.